Hey guys, this is Mr. Mahmood. Again, I don't need to spend a lot of time here, hopefully, but uh, I, I just want to stress again at the beginning of this video that I am in no way trying to convince anyone of whether or not evolutionary theory is something that you should necessarily believe. All I am trying to do as a scientist is discuss the scientific principles behind evolutionary theory and talk about the different sources of evidence that are used to support the idea. All right, uh, the third category is a pretty large one. There are different subcategories that we're going to talk about here, but it's basically the idea of comparative anatomy, which is the physical components. This is what was done before the biochemical, before we really had a deep understanding of genetic variations and really looking at similarities that way. We tried to relate organisms just based off of their physical components and physical properties, whether that's large scale or some of the more unique things that we're going to talk about here in a second. The more large scale things are what we call homologous structures. So homologous, I hope you remember, we've used the term before, we talked about homologous chromosomes when we were referring to meiosis, how homologous chromosomes are the same chromosomes of the human DNA line or any species DNA finding each other. So, you, f you know, you have two first chromosomes, your mom and your dad's first chromosomes. When they find each other in a tetrad, they're considered homologous because they're the same. Uh, homozygous, you remember the prefix homo means they're both, both of the alleles are either dominant or recessive. So homologous, again, means the same. So when we talk about homologous structures, you may look at these four, they don't really look the same to the, uh, the uneducated eye, right? But as you will now be educated to the idea, even though they may perform unique functions and because of that have slight adaptations that make them more successful in one environment compared to another, structurally, they're the same. They all have the same basic structural component. This represents the arm of four different animal species here. The one on the left is the human, and then it shows a dog, a bird, and then a, uh, an alligator. Now, even though they have different lengths and thicknesses of their different bone structures on the forelimb, they all have the basic arm structure. They have a long upper arm bone called the humerus. Uh, it's not very humerus, really, especially if you hit your funny bone, right? It's definitely not very humerus, but that's what the top bone's called. Then they have two bones in the forelimb and the forearm. This, the one on the thumb side is called the radius. The one on the pinky side is called the ulna. We've talked about those two before. Then you have your carpals, which are the bones of your wrist, your metacarpals, which are the bones of your hand, and then your phalanges or fa phalanges or however people diff different people pronounce them are the bones of the fingers. All of these four species have them, but they're slightly unique in terms of their composition. And that's what we consider homologous structures. The same structures, but unique functions. And those unique functions and if we think about evolutionary theory, are the way they are because of unique environmental pressures. If there's unique environmental pressure that requires an arm to do a certain task, then it's the one that's going to be selected naturally in that environment. But in another environment, that may not be the case. For example, if we follow that theory, if, uh, if all these species were underwater and um, require the ability to manipulate and move in the water, you need a, a pretty wide surface area and fairly short arm lengths to be able to really propel yourself in the water. The more surface area you have, flat surface area, the more propulsion you can get with friction on the surface or underneath the surface of the water, then it definitely would make sense that the arm there on the left would be the most successful at doing that. So if you had all four of these species, all of them were living underwater, over time, if you follow evolutionary theory, the arm limbs on the right, the ones that have that naturally, are going to be most successful in getting what they need and maneuvering, and the three on the left will slowly leave that gene pool, either dying off or moving to other parts where maybe they're more successful. So little by little, that one there on the right is now the one that's predominant in that environment, whereas, let's say, the third one, having very light, low-density bones, is what gives these species the ability of flight. You can't fly if you have very heavy bones, but if you have light bones like this, thin bones, then you have a much better chance of propulsion as, as long as other factors are available as well. So these are the bird species, and if the need was to be able to survive off the surface of the earth for multiple reasons, the other three obviously would not survive in that environment, and you'd see a much higher proportion of that one. So again, evolutionary theory suggests that even though all of these have the same basic structure, they all are uniquely fit for their environment because over time, those with the natural traits, the natural adaptations, have survived in that environment. So you see variations developing over a long period of time and how theoretically they could have all originated from a common ancestor with a common arm bone structure 
that maybe was originally the same, but because different groups were put in different environments and with different environmental pressures, certain traits started showing up as more successful in different regions. And now with those unique traits, giving enough time, will develop into new species, which develops what we consider as speciation and new unique components of the same basic arm structure in different parts and different environments. So all of this is what we consider homologous structure. So the evolutionary connection here, even though this is scientific fact, you can look at an x-ray of these four species, it looks exactly like this. Um, the fact that they all have the same basic structure then gets you to the bridge of evolutionary theory where it's possible that all of these could have originated from one or a small number of common ancestors with a basic arm limb that was passed on to all of these different species and eventually became all of these different species. So homologous structure means same structure but unique function due to theoretically due to environmental pressures. Another way of looking at comparative anatomy is thinking about something called vestigial structure. A vestigial structure is a part of the body that is not currently in use by the organism. Currently is a very important word there. So a part of the body that has no current use or current function uh, in an organism is what we consider a vestigial structure. So there are a few examples of vestigial structures of the human body, so we'll talk about a couple of them here. Uh, one very common one is something found on your large intestine, a little tiny flap of tissue called the appendix. You probably have all heard of your, an appendix before. Uh, the appendix that's found in your body in your digestive system is a little tiny flap of tissue at the bottom of what's considered your ascending colon. It's the beginning of the large intestine. Where the small intestine and the large intestine meet, there's a little flap of tissue there. It does absolutely nothing for us. Another example of a vestigial structure that does absolutely nothing for us are, are your tonsils. They're little tiny flaps of tissue that hang down from within your uh, oral cavity. Now, those are two very common examples of areas where you really don't need. So let's say you're in a position where you had an infection. Um, there's one person with an infection in their heart and then there's another person with an infection in their appendix, right? They both have the same kind of level of an infection, a bacterial infection, something that could become pretty harmful pretty quickly, right? The doctors have a choice. They can do one of two things. They can either treat the infection, usually with antibiotics and different medications, and try to fight off the infection, or they can just cut it off and just get rid of the infection that way. Don't let it spread. Just cut off the tissue that the infection is occurring in. Now, obviously, if the infection is in your heart, which of those two choices will they go for? Usually, door number one, right? Just try to kill off the infection and do what you can to eliminate that problem without actually removing any tissue of the heart, because obviously you want to keep everything there so that the heart can function the way it's supposed to. But if there was an infection in your appendix, they could treat it with antibiotics and, and try to kill off the bacteria before it spreads into your uh, large intestine, but usually your doctors will choose door number two. If there's an infection in your appendix, rather than trying to fight it off or do something to control the infection, they'll just chop it off because you have absolutely no need for your appendix. Your appendix serves no purpose for you at this point in our evolutionary history. Now I stress that for a reason, because here's the bridge evolutionary scientists will take these vestigial structures and think even though there's no current use for that structure theoretically it could have been used and needed a long time ago and that's where we start thinking about possible bridges of early groups of the species or possibly early ancestors of the current species based on the vestigial structures that are there how they may have been different a long time ago based on these parts that may have had a purpose back then. Uh, the evolutionary possibility, one, one possible suggestion of, of the appendix, is that it could very well have had a purpose in digestion. Um, let's say the, the basic theory is that it had the ability of producing enzymes that help you break down cellulose. Cellulose, as you guys know, is a long complex sugar made by plants. It's basically the majority of the structure of a plant and makes up the cell wall and things like that. So when you're eating plants and you eat uh, vegetation, you take in a great deal of cellulose. Currently, the human body cannot break down cellulose. We can't do anything with it, so it just passes straight through our, our body. This is what we think of as fiber. You can't do anything with fiber, but it is something that is encouraged in your diet to help you kind of flush out your system because it just 
kind of pushes everything out. But you don't really gain any nutrients from it. You can't break it apart because the activation energy is too high. You don't have the enzymes to break it down. The theory is that the appendix a long time ago could have provided enzymes to help you break down cellulose which evolutionary theorists would then take to say that that means that a long time ago the the earlier forms of the human species uh, or the possible ancestors of the human species had a very high vegetative diet which means that a lot of their diet had to do with vegetation and they needed the ability to break down cellulose so that's where the bridge comes in they start looking for clues of how these vestigial structures could have served a purpose a long time ago and then if we follow evolutionary theory the basic progression would be that over time other sources of food became available and plentiful for our human species and the ascent the descendants of our human species so the need for a functioning and strong appendix was no longer a pressure so that meant if you had a person with a very strong functioning appendix and someone with a very weak appendix or basically just a flap that didn't do anything they both still survived equally well because now the need wasn't to break down cellulose anymore, they were able to get their nutrients from else, other, other sources of food. So if you follow that same concept over many, many generations, because the appendix was not a necessity for survival, having a strong appendix wasn't needed. So that means little by little, the proportion of people with a weak appendix went up because it, it didn't need to be strong in order to survive. And then little by little, that what used to be a very strong functioning organ could slowly, slowly wither away to almost nothing because how little it was needed in order for them to survive. So the pressure wasn't there for a strong appendix, so it's no longer needed, which could theoretically allow over time for you to just have a little remnants of an appendix now, or what we consider to be a vestigial organ that's available today. So scientists use vestigial structures to connect uh, and possibly predict and possibly try to visualize uh, the environmental conditions of previous descendants of that current species. Vestigial structures are actually something that was brought out by Charles Darwin's grandfather. So uh, Darwin definitely had a lot of family ties to this idea of the natural progression of life. He didn't just come up with it on his own. He did have a lot of connection to this. Um, but this is a very, very unique component that is used to help kind of think about and use this context clues as what species could have been like a long time ago. Uh, another very good example of a vestigial structure is something that's found in current species of whales. Uh, this is a skeleton of, uh, I believe, a blue whale. And if you look at these species of whales, you notice a lot of skeletal structure that you would probably expect. You'd probably expect to see based on their external physique, what they look like. But something that's very unique is what you look at there at letter C. Now, you may have a hard time kind of visualizing this, but letter C represents a pelvis. It's a vestigial pelvis. It's in the area in the range that is in very strong connection, and the physical composition of that bone is in very strong connection with the pelvis that's found both in our body and in a lot of other organisms as well. So if we think of this, that whales do have a vestigial pelvis. This is scientific fact. The bridge, then, is to think why they may have needed a pelvis in the past, why the descendants of the current whale species may have needed a pelvis. First, we have to now understand what a pelvis is and what it does. The function of your pelvis, the human pelvis, is to cradle or support the weight of your upper body. Think about why you need to do that. Let's, uh, let's say you have a, a table. Think about any table. Look around if you have a table in your room. It probably has four legs, right? That table has four legs. What would happen if you chopped off one of the legs of that table? It would probably just tilt over and fall, right? Because at this point, that table, the weight of the table is evenly distributed along, along those four legs. So if any one of the legs breaks, the whole table loses its balance, right? However, in the human body, the pelvis supports a significant amount of weight of the upper body, which allows one of the legs to actually be able to lift off of the ground without you falling over. If you didn't have a pelvis, your two legs would equally support the weight of your upper body, which means if you were to lift one of the legs, you immediately would just fall like a table. Because of the even support, you're losing one, the whole thing falls over, you have no balance. But the pelvis supporting the upper body means that you can actually lift the leg, 
without falling over. So why would an organism need to be able to lift a leg? What does lifting a leg provide for you? What if there was a pattern? What if you lifted one leg, then you put that leg down and you lifted another one? Then you put that leg down and lifted another one? And you keep doing this back and forth. What does this give you the ability to do? Walk, exactly. So here's the crazy concept. If whales have a vestigial pelvis, and the pelvis ultimately allows the ability to walk. Is it possible that descendants of the whale species had limbs that were actually legs that allowed them to walk? And they needed the pelvis at that time for balance. If we think that may be true, then is it possible that whales could have needed the ability to walk on dry land and maybe weren't always surviving in the water. If that's true, could the descendant of the whale species actually be some sort of a large land animal, some land mammal that slowly moved into an oceanic environment due to certain environmental pressures? And then as it gets into the water, the need for strong limbs and therefore a strong pelvis is no longer a high pressure. So little by little, the pelvis structure no longer is needed for survival and becomes this vestigial remnants that we see today. That's the theory. That's the bridge. The idea that maybe, based on the vestigial pelvis, a whale at one point had limbs and actually walked on dry land. It's possible. And that's where evolutionary theory comes into play. So vestigial structures are used to support and possibly uh, make assumptions uh, and use as context clues as to what these organisms or the descendants of these organisms could have been like a very long time ago. Uh, the third category within comparative anatomy is called embryology. Now this basically looks at the embryos of species. And again, we've done the whole physical comparisons. We've talked about homologous structures and things like that. Physically, you look at mature organisms and you see how similar or different they may be. We've done the genetic comparison at a much smaller level. We look genetically at the amino acid sequencing and see how unique uh, or different they may be and how that has a very strong tie, obviously, to the DNA-based sequences. But now we find kind of a middle range. We look at the embryologic development. The embryo is early in development of the next generation. We talked about the zygote being made. This is the very first cell. After multiple series of mitosis, that zygote will eventually develop into an embryo. That embryo will continue to develop into what's considered a fetus. And then that fetus finally develops into the mature uh, infant of the next generation. Right? Now, even though at the infancy level, the first minutes of, of independent life, organisms of different species are physically significantly different from each other, at the embryologic level, it's very possible that they're very, very similar, and in fact they are. As you can see here, these six embryos are of six different species of organisms. And although they're drastically different at their infancy level, here at the embryologic level, here when they're embryos, it's very hard to tell them apart. Can you tell which of these six is the human? It's hard to tell, right? First of all, it's hard to imagine that any of these are the human because they all have a tail. They all have gills. Remember the scenario I gave a while back in the previous lecture about having gills? All of us had gills. We all had them. However, after the embryologic phase, the gills are eliminated and we move into the concept of lungs and developing into that. So at the embryo level, there are a lot of physical comparisons to other species. So this is another way that we try to kind of bridge and compare organisms to each other and classify organisms. For example, all the organisms that are in the phylum Chordata, which we'll talk about uh, in a few units here, have very unique characteristics that allow for a vertebrae or a backbone or a spinal cord passing through that backbone. So that tail that you see there is the backbone of all of the chordates, all of the phylum Chordata within the kingdom Animalia. And over time, these embryos that are all very unique eventually develop into significantly different species. So definitely at the bottom there you see the fetuses of each one of these. They're very unique and you can definitely start to distinguish one from the other. But at the embryologic level, at the embryo, there are a whole lot of similarities. So this is the scientific fact. If you look at the embryos of different species, this is exactly what they look like. Well, these are animations, but they are very similar to each other. Uh, and then the bridge again suggests the idea of common ancestry. If they're so genetically and physically similar, 
at this level here, at the embryologic level, theoretically they could have possibly stemmed from a common ancestor that was eventually passed on to these unique species that developed from it. So again, this shows even though there's drastic differences in the physical structure when they're fully matured, at this embryologic level there are very, very distinct similarities and possibly suggests, again, the idea of a common ancestry that they could have all developed from one or a few common species that had this basic structure at the embryologic level. And then because of pressures became the variety of the chordates and the, the different spine uh, and vertebrate animals that you see today. That's again the bridge connecting embryology to evolutionary theory. Alright, so all that represents comparative anatomy. Make sure you're comfortable with all three parts, homologous structures, vestigial structures, and embryology. The final category of uh, different sources of evidence supporting evolutionary theory is biogeography. Biogeography is basically just a comparison of the physical location of both living and fossil records of organisms throughout the world. Biogeography is something that Charles Darwin really focused in on when he was on his, uh, on his trip as a naturalist for the HMS Beagle. A lot of his uh, observations were focusing in on a couple of different things. One being the idea that two completely different regions of the world that had very similar climates because they were found on the same latitudes of the earth and things like that, very similar climate conditions, temperature, amounts of rainfall, things like that, had significantly unique organisms. That's one component of biogeography, that regions with the same climate in different parts of the world had very, very different organisms. Whereas at the same time, other parts of the world, or even within that same climate, he would find species of organisms that were almost completely identical to each other. And they're so far away from each other that there's no way they could have ever met within certain lifespans. So those suggestions give way to a lot of understanding of the Earth's history. We'll talk about each one. One being the idea that you have very similar species, or at least let's say very similar fossils of species in completely different regions of the world. So that's the scientific fact. There are significant sources of scientific evidence saying that there are regions of the world that are very far away from each other that have almost identical representations of life in terms of fossil records or even living examples of species. They're very, very similar, almost completely identical, but very, very far away from each other. That's a scientific fact. That is true. The evolutionary theory, or the, the understanding of how Earth's changed over time, which is what James Hutton and Charles Lyell were really big uh, in emphasizing, is that it's possible that the link there happened because at one point in history, those land masses were close enough together that that was all one big population, one big species. And then because over a very long period of time, millions of years, there was this drastic separation, you now see those two species in that different, uh, different parts of the world. And then uh, the opposite reference, that areas of very similar climate can have drastically unique species from each other, could be a strong suggestion to the evolutionary theory, where species develop very unique traits because of very unique pressures in different parts of the world. Even though the climates are very similar, because of the other competing factors that may have been in that same environment, different traits become more successful in different parts of the world. So little by little, that separation of the Earth that theoretically could have happened, and evolutionary theorists and just uh, a lot of supporters of tectonic plate movement and the idea of Pangaea and these early land masses that were much larger, um, this idea of biogeography supports the possibility that there could have been very strong land masses with unique populations that were separated to give for a lot of the similarities. You see the diagram there that shows you how certain species of fossils are found in very unique parts of each of these land masses in their present configuration. So the this diagram shows you how they could have looked a long time ago in one land mass and how you can see there are definite patterns for these fossils and then as they break off you see that you see them where they are in the same land mass just in different parts of the world or the diagram there underneath shows how theoretically you could have started with some sort of a common ancestor some sort of a large land animal like a common armadillo anteater kind of species but because of the separation they could have developed unique environmental characteristics and then unique adaptations that slowly allowed for speciation to occur, where new species started to develop in different parts of the world that all could have originated from a common species in this common landmass. 
So both of these variations um, could be used by evolutionary theorists to support the idea of this common landmass and common ancestors that slowly bridged out into what we see today. All right, so these are all different categories of evidence supporting the evolutionary theory, which again is entirely up to you in terms of uh, how much you want to believe of it, if any at all. But I do again expect you to understand and respect how evolutionary scientists use these concrete sources of, uh, of evidence to support the idea that the Earth has gradually changed and the life on Earth has changed with it possibly all originating from one or a few common ancestors. All right, So that's evolution. I hope you guys understand it and I hope you have developed at least an appreciation for it. Uh, the next lecture will take what you've learned and will relate it to what you should already know about genetics to develop some very very unique and hopefully pretty interesting understandings of how populations actually change and what, what the driving forces are behind that. Alright, that's it for this video. I will see you next time.